Chapter Ten of Bushido, the Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in December two thousand and nine. Bushido, the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter Ten: Education and Training of a Samurai. Life being regarded as the means whereby to serve his master, and its ideal being set upon honor, the whole education and training of a samurai were conducted accordingly. The first point to observe in knightly pedagogics was to build up character, leaving in the shade the subtler faculties of prudence, intelligence, and dialectics. We have seen the important part aesthetic accomplishments played in his education indispensable as they were to a man of culture they were accessories rather than essentials of samurai training intellectual superiority was of course esteemed but the word chi which was employed to denote intellectuality meant wisdom in the first instance and placed knowledge only in a very subordinate place the tripod that supported the framework of bushido was said to be chi jin yu respectively wisdom benevolence and courage a samurai was essentially a man of action science was without the pale of his activity he took advantage of it in so far as it concerned his profession of arms religion and theology were relegated to the priests he concerned himself with them in so far as they helped to nourish courage like an english poet the samurai believed Tis not the creed that saves the man, but it is the man that justifies the creed. Philosophy and literature formed the chief part of his intellectual training, but even in the pursuit of these it was not objective truth that he strove after. Literature was pursued mainly as a pastime, and philosophy as a practical aid in the formation of character, if not for the exposition of some military or political problem. From what has been said, it will not be surprising to note that the curriculum of studies, according to the pedagogics of Bushido, consisted mainly of the following fencing, archery, jiu jitsu or yawara, horsemanship, the use of the spear, tactics, calligraphy, ethics, literature, and history. Of these, jiu jitsu and calligraphy may require a few words of explanation. Great stress was laid on good writing, probably because our logograms, partaking as they do of the nature of pictures, possess artistic value, and also because chirography was accepted as indicative of one's personal character. Jiu-jitsu may be briefly defined as an application of anatomical knowledge to the purpose of offense or defense. It differs from wrestling in that it does not depend upon muscular strength. It differs from other forms of attack in that it uses no weapon. Its feet consist in clutching or striking such part of the enemy's body as will make him numb and incapable of resistance. Its object is not to kill, but to incapacitate one for action for the time being. A subject of study which one would expect to find in military education, and which is rather conspicuous by its absence in the Bushido course of instruction, is mathematics. This, however, can be readily explained in part by the fact that feudal warfare was not carried on with scientific precision. Not only that, but the whole training of the samurai was unfavorable to fostering numerical notions. Chivalry is uneconomical. It boasts of penury. It says with Venditius that ambition, the soldier's virtue, rather makes choice of loss than gain which darkens him. Don Quixote takes more pride in his rusty spear and skin and bone horse than in gold and lands, and the samurai is in hearty sympathy with his exaggerated confrere of La Mancha. He disdains money itself, the art of making or hoarding it. It is to him veritably filthy lucre. The hackneyed expression to describe the decadence of an age is that the civilians loved money and the soldiers feared death. Niggardliness of gold and of life excites as much disapprobation as their lavish use is panegorized. Less than all things, says a current precept, men must grudge money. It is by riches that wisdom is hindered. 
Hence, children were brought up with utter disregard of economy. It was considered bad taste to speak of it, and ignorance of the value of different coins was a token of good breeding. Knowledge of numbers was indispensable in the mustering of forces as well, as in the distribution of benefices and fiefs, but the counting of money was left to meaner hands. In many feudatories, public finance was administered by a lower kind of samurai or by priests. Every thinking Bushi knew well enough that money formed the sinews of war, but he did not think of raising the appreciation of money to a virtue. It is true that thrift was enjoined by Bushido, but not for economical reasons, so much as for the exercise of abstinence. Luxury was thought the greatest menace to manhood, and severest simplicity was required of the warrior class, sumptuary laws being enforced in many of the clans. We read that in ancient Rome the farmers of revenue and other financial agents were gradually raised to the rank of knights, the state thereby showing its appreciation of their service, and of the importance of money itself. How closely this was connected with the luxury and avarice of the Romans may be imagined. Not so with the precepts of knighthood. These persisted in systematically regarding finance as something low, low as compared with moral and intellectual vocations. Money and the love of it being thus diligently ignored, Bushido itself could long remain free from a thousand and one evils of which money is the root. This is sufficient reason for the fact that our public men have long been free from corruption, but, alas, how fast plutocracy is making its way in our time and generation. The mental discipline, which would nowadays be chiefly aided by the study of mathematics, was supplied by literary exegesis and deontological discussions. Very few abstract subjects troubled the mind of the young, the chief aim of their education being, as I have said, decision of character. People whose minds were simply stored with information found no great admirers. Of the three services of studies that Bacon gives, for delight, ornament, and ability, Bushido had decided preference for the last, where their use was in judgment and the disposition of business. Whether it was for the disposition of public business or for the exercise of self-control, it was with a practical end in view that education was conducted. Learning without thought, said Confucius, is labor lost. Thought without learning is perilous. When character and not intelligence, when the soul and not the head, is chosen by a teacher for the material to work upon and to develop, his vocation partakes of a sacred character. It is the parent who has borne me, it is the teacher who makes me man. With this idea, therefore, the esteem in which one's preceptor was held was very high. A man to evoke such confidence and respect from the young must necessarily be endowed with superior personality without lacking erudition. He was a father to the fatherless and an adviser to the erring. Thy father and thy mother, so runs our maxim, are like heaven and earth. Thy teacher and thy lord are like the sun and moon. The present system of paying for every sort of service was not in vogue among the adherents of Bushido. It believed in a service which can be rendered only without money and without price. Spiritual service, be it of priest or teacher, was not to be repaid in gold or silver, not because it was valueless, but because it was invaluable. Here, the non-arithmetical honored instinct of Bushido taught a truer lesson than modern political economy for wages and salaries can be paid only for services whose results are definite, tangible, and measurable, whereas the best service done in education, namely in soul development, and this includes the services of a pastor, is not definite, tangible, or measurable. Being immeasurable, money, the ostensible measure of value, is of inadequate use. Usage sanctioned that pupils brought to their teachers money or goods at different seasons of the year, but these were not payments but offerings, which indeed were welcome to the recipients as they were usually men of stern caliber, boasting of honorable penury, too dignified to work with their hands, and too proud to beg. They were grave personifications of high spirits undaunted by adversity. 
they were an embodiment of what was considered as an end of all learning and were thus a living example of the discipline of disciplines self-control which was universally required of samurai end of chapter ten